Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our program, 2023 Virginia Energy General Assembly Legislative Update. My name is Brad Nowak. I'm a partner and co-chair of the Energy Practice Group at Williams Mullen, based in its Tyson's Virginia office. I'm joined this morning by my colleagues, Patrick Cushing and Chris McDonald. Patrick is the vice chair of our firm's government relations team, and Chris is director of government relations. Both are based in our Richmond, Virginia office. Patrick and Chris have been heavily involved in lobbying government relations on behalf of renewable energy clients at the Virginia General Assembly, including during this past legislative session. In addition to Patrick and Chris, our government relations team has several other professionals who have extensive experience actively counseling and advocating for clients and issues before the Virginia and North Carolina General Assemblies and the administrations in both states. Before we kick off today's program, I have just a few housekeeping items to go over. At any point during today's presentation, you may submit questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer questions at the end of the presentation, time permitting. If you have any audio or technical problems, please use the same Q&A button and someone will help get those resolved. And finally, you'll receive a copy of today's presentation by email later today. Today's program is the first installment of our spring renewable energy webinar series. We have several other webinars over the coming months, including on April 13th, we'll have a webinar on land use and solar permitting considerations when citing solar and renewable energy projects in Virginia. On April 27th, we'll cover solar and energy storage permit by rule. On May 16th, we'll address certificates of public convenience and necessity for solar projects at the Virginia State Corporation Commission, and then on June 6th, we'll cover recent trends in real estate options and leases for renewable energy projects. Be on the lookout for invitations um, uh, after this webinar. And now I'll pass the program over to Patrick Cushing, who will provide a roadmap of today's program. Patrick? All right. Thanks, Brad. Um, taking a look at all the participants, see a lot of names I know, so glad to see everybody here. Um, so in today's webinar, Chris and I are going to go over a, a, a general overview of the legislative session, which has adjourned, and we've got a reconvened session coming up to consider some governor's amendments uh, in about a, uh, two weeks. Uh, there are some specific bills that we are going to cover in this webinar. I will note that this is not an exclusive or exhaustive list. We have picked what we think are probably some of the more prominent renewable energy related bills. Uh, which include uh, SCC vacancies, some local land use permit extension bills, uh, a general overview of some bills that went after the Clean Economy Act, uh, shared solar legislation. There was one bill on offshore wind development, and then a, a pretty dominant theme within this session uh, in the energy market is electric utility regulation. So Chris is gonna go over uh, some of those key bills. Also, competitive procurement of renewable energy sources. Um, also, we're going to touch on nuclear energy, while not traditionally in, in the renewable space. I think with this administration, an emphasis on small modular reactors is worth discussing. And then our 2023 budget, which is not complete, um, so a little indeterminate on that, but we want to give everybody an update. And then we'll conclude with uh, some pretty significant changes on the landscape in the Virginia General Assembly, as we've seen a record number of retirements and uh, races that will complicate the picture with new uh, legislative districts throughout the state. All right, next slide. And with that, I will kick it over to Chris to go over a general overview of the session. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, good to be here today. Um, as most of us know uh, on this call, this year was uh, the short session in Virginia, lasting just 46 days. So the General Assembly convened on Wednesday, January 11th, and adjourned Sidey Die Saturday evening on February 25th. Um, as was the case last year, we still have split power in the General Assembly. The Republicans hold a narrow 52 to 48 margin in the House of Delegates, while the Democrats hold a narrow 22 to 18 uh, majority in the Senate. Um, really, the only change in composition or political landscape for this year's session uh, was that the Democrats picked up one seat in the Senate. Republican Jen Kiggins was elected to Congress back in November of 2022, uh, and Democrat Aaron Rouse was narrowly elected to fill that seat, taking a 21 to 19 majority up to a 22 to 18 majority. 
Um, actually, over the last month, the Democrats were back down to 21 to 18 after Jennifer McClellan was elected to Congress. Uh, but just last night, Delegate Lamont Bagby was elected to that seat for the state Senate. Um, so the Dems will return to a 22 to 18 split in time for the reconvened session. Um, despite the short session, it was as busy a session as ever. Uh, nearly 2,200 bills were introduced this session with just 867 making it to the governor's desk, uh, actually making for the lowest pass rate since 2018. Um, we also saw an incredibly uh, near historic level of energy bills this session. Uh, at last count, we were tracking well over 120 bills, not to mention various budget items. Uh, the governor had until this uh, Monday at midnight to sign, veto, or amend bills. And now, as Patrick mentioned, the General Assembly will return to Richmond on April 12th to handle any of these amendments or vetoes. So next slide, please. First topic to cover today is the State Corporation Commission. Uh, as many, if not all, on the call are aware, we're really dealing with a prolonged vacancy issue on the SEC right now. Uh, in 2022, Angela Navarro was not reappointed to her position when her term expired, and no replacement was ever named or agreed upon. Uh, then, at the end of last year, Judge uh, Judith Yagman resigned from her position on December 31st, uh, leaving the SEC with just one remaining judge, Jamal Hudson. Um, the General Assembly couldn't come to an agreement on a commissioner in 2022, and then we came into this session with two openings. Um, so Delegate Kathy Byron and Senator Scott Suravel attempted to find a creative way to address this kind of stalemate in the GA and fill these vacancies. Um, so you'll see on the slide, State Senate Bill 1482 and House Bill 2463 proposed a temporary expansion of the SEC, taking it from three judges to four. Upon the next expiration of a judge's term, however, it would revert back to three judges. So it was kind of a temporary addition with a planned uh, elimination uh, in a few years. This was really intended to allow the Senate Dems and the House Republicans to each have a chance to pick a judge and fill these vacancies. Um, initially, the bills really rocketed through their respective chambers, um, but ultimately ran into some trouble at the very end of the session. Uh, the word was that even with the newly added seats, there was just too much disagreement between the chambers and between the parties over who would actually fill these hypothetical new seats. So towards the end of session, the bills were put into conference, delayed a few times, and ultimately not acted on in time for the Senate uh, and House's adjournment on uh, the 25th. So they died with adjournment. Next slide. Next topic to cover today uh, would be permit extensions. And we, we've seen a number of bills like this in recent memory. Uh, this year, there were two sets of bills worth mentioning that both provide extensions for local land use approvals. As initially drafted, these bills were actually in conflict and wouldn't have really worked together. So over the course of session, they were retooled and rewritten to instead work in concert with one another. Uh, the first set of bills you have would be Senate Bill 1205 and House Bill 1665. Uh, and these bills are really intended to target the continued COVID-19 related permit delays. Um, these bills extend the sunset date from July 1, 2023 to July 1 of 2025 for all local land use approvals that were valid and outstanding as of July 1, 2020. So this covers permits for solar, battery storage, as well as really any other number of development activities uh, not related to renewable energy. So home building, commercial real estate development, what have you. Um, these bills were both just signed into law on Monday. Next, you have Senator Lewis's SB 1390 and Delegate Hodge's House Bill 14, uh, 1944, excuse me. Um, while that first batch of bills I mentioned really are for a mandatory and for all permits, this set of bills instead provides a local option for permit extensions specifically for solar developments. Um, specifically, this legislation authorizes localities to extend by resolution um, any special exception, special use permit, or conditional use permit for solar development to July 1, 2026 or longer. Um, these bills were also signed into law on Monday. Next slide. So the next three slides uh, deal with the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which the last several years have proven, uh, despite efforts to the contrary at times, remain the standing law of the land in Virginia. Um, as was the case last year, we saw numerous bills filed this session attempting to revise or roll back the goals or requirements of the Clean Economy Act. 
And like last year, we were also able to really neutralize these bills or defeat them. The first bills I want to mention are SB 1125 and House Bill 2130. And these are kind of the, the broader VCEA rollback bills that proposed three things. First, they would have allowed the SEC to extend certain RPS timelines if they find compliance with them would threaten the reliability or security of the grid. Second, in any proceeding by Dominion or APCO to construct or acquire new generation resources, the SEC would be required to consider ratepayer impacts of those resources as compared to alternative sources of generation that aren't RPS eligible. And then third, it would require the SEC to issue recommendations for additional statutory changes to improve energy reliability, reduce, reduce electricity rates, and meet forecasted energy needs. To be frank, this kind of three-pronged approach was actually a much softer uh, and more limited approach than how the bills were originally drafted. Nonetheless, neither bill uh, survived their journey through the General Assembly. Senate Bill 1125 was defeated early on in session in Senate Commerce and Labor, and House Bill 2130 passed the House, but ultimately was also defeated in Senate Commerce and Labor. Now, it's worth briefly noting here that these bills have had something of a resurrection in the last 24 hours. Um, yesterday, amendments were published on Virginia's legislative information system by the governor um, for a separate bill that actually include these three prongs in that bill now. Um, it's highly unlikely that that language will uh, survive the Senate, uh, but it's certainly worth watching on April 12th when the General Assembly reconvenes. Next slide. Here are just a few more bills that uh, sought to amend or alter the Clean Economy Act. Um, first, HB 2197 from Delegate Byron sought to change the definition of renewable energy to include advanced nuclear technology as well as hydrogen technology. And in this bill, advanced nuclear technology is namely small modular reactors. This bill passed the House of Delegates, but was defeated in Senate Commerce and Labor, where really the main concerns of committee members were that SMRs didn't seem commercially viable or ready for mass deployment yet, that the bill didn't define hydrogen or really differentiate between the types of hydrogen generation, uh, and that these new definitions would have a detrimental impact on the continued development and deployment of solar and wind in Virginia. Um, despite this bill's defeat, much like those last two bills I mentioned, this bill also had something of a revival this week, as the governor has offered amendments to a separate bill to include the provisions of this legislation as well. And then finally on this slide, Senate Bill 1121 and House Bill, uh, oh, excuse me, Senate Bill 1231 and House Bill uh, 2026. Um, these bills targeted uh, attempts to allow certain biomass facilities to operate beyond the Clean Economy Act's retirement deadline. Um, these bills would require the biomass facilities to remain open and qualify for RPS goals as long as they're only burning waste wood from forestry operations. Thanks to their limited scope, these bills actually passed both chambers uh, and were expected to be signed into law without much fuss, but it's actually this bill that uh, was amended by the governor this week and became the carrier for the nuclear and hydrogen bill language as well as the Clean Economy Act bill language. As I mentioned a little earlier, it's highly unlikely that the Senate adopts this new language having already defeated these measures once, but again, worth watching as we come into the reconvene session. Next slide. The final two uh, bills or pieces of legislation regarding the Clean Economy Act worth mentioning today um, deal with uh, energy intensive trade exposed industries or EITE uh, industries. House Bill 1430 from Delegate Ware was a fresh attempt at legislation that he had actually introduced last year. This bill would have established a two gigawatt pilot program that would have exempted certain EITE industries uh, from Clean Economy Act goals and requirements regarding the procurement of renewable and zero carbon sources of energy. Um, this legislation did pass the House, but it became clear towards the end of session that the votes weren't there and that Senate Commerce and Labor was gonna vote this measure down. So ultimately Delegate Ware opted to strike his bill. Now, Senator McPike and Delegate Reed also attempted to kind of preemptively head off the concept of a pilot program and instead introduce their own EITE bills, Senate Bill 1454 and House Bill 1761. 
And these bills simply directed the SEC to further study this issue in the off season. Um, House Bill 1761 was quickly defeated in the House in favor of the aforementioned House Bill 1430. And Senate Bill 1454 passed the Senate, but on the House side, it was amended to conform with House Bill 1430. So when it made it back over to the Senate, uh, the Senate opted instead to strike the bill uh, rather than pursue this further. Next slide. Offshore wind has been a, a real point of conversation and even at times contention within the General Assembly and the governor's office really over the last year or two, particularly related to the costs of uh, development. Nonetheless, this actually didn't really translate to um, an influx or massive uptick in wind-related bills. So really the one bill worth mentioning today uh, was Senate Bill 1441 from Senator Mamie Locke and House Bill 2444 from Delegate Rob Bloxham. Uh, these bills require that in conducting reviews of cost recovery requests, the SEC must also consider economic development benefits of the project. Uh, this includes things like capital investment, job creation, and the potential impact of the development of a supply chain in Virginia. Uh, additionally, these bills accelerate the timeline for utilities to build or purchase more offshore wind generation facilities from 2034 to 2032. Now, these bills passed both chambers um, and were sent to the governor, but just yesterday, proposed amendments from the governor went live. And these amendments put up a number of additional guardrails and requirements for wind development, including more measures related to uh, competitive solicitation. These bills will also be taken back up and the amendments will be addressed by the General Assembly uh, on April 12th when they reconvene. Next slide. All right. Utility regulation reform. These bills really dominated a lot of the conversations about energy policy this session and were worked on by an army of lobbyists and stakeholders and legislators right up until the very last second of session. Now, these were amongst the most technical bills at the session. They're predominantly consumer and utility facing, so they don't really concern the immediate business of renewable energy development. So I'll try to be quick with these, uh, especially being uh, mindful of the time. First up would be the Dominion Reform Bill, Senate Bill 1265 and House Bill 1770. Uh, after a grueling process through the House and Senate, Senator Sazel and Delegate Kilgore's bill in its final form set forth a number of provisions. They set Dominion's profit rate at 9.7% for the next two years and then give the SEC discretion to determine it after that, changes triennial rate reviews to biennial rate reviews, rolls approximately $350 million in current rate adjustment clauses into the utilities base rate. It provides $1.6 billion in bond authority to, up, to finance upfront fuel costs in a fuel securitization effort. It creates a deferred fuel uh, cost charge, decreases the percentage of owner over earnings that Dominion may keep from 30% to 15%, and then finally requires Dominion to ensure it maintains its common equity capitalization to total capitalization ratio at a level equal to 52.1%. Um, as amended, both of these bills did make it to the governor's desk, who just this week also sent down a number of amendments, um, some technical, some substantive, that will be addressed in a few weeks. Next slide. Next up, we have the big APCO reform bill. Like its Dominion counterpart, this bill was multifaceted. It authorizes APCO to petition the SEC for a financing order for deferred fuel costs and lays out a number of requirements and steps to do so. It creates a deferred fuel cost charge. It changes triennial rate reviews to biennial rate reviews, provides for over earnings to be returned to customers, and removes the requirement that APCO file an integrated resource plan or IRP with the SEC. Um, these bills also endured numerous rounds of revisions as the bills made their way through the General Assembly, but ultimately they did pass both chambers and were sent to the governor who handed down similar amendments to the Dominion bill. Next slide, please. And finally, we have what was called the Affordable Energy Act brought to you by Delegate Ware, Delegate Sullivan and Senator McClellan. As you see on the slide, the SEC currently only has the authority to reduce rates based on utility over earnings. And these bills seek to expand this authority and reform this authority. Specifically, this legislation provides that if the SEC determines that a utility's base rates will, 
on an ongoing forward basis either produce revenues in excess of the utility's authorized rate of return or revenues below the utility's authorized rate of return, the SEC is required to order reductions or increases to ensure that the base rates are just and reasonable and provide the utility um, the leeway to recover costs and earn a fair rate of review. Uh, these bills passed both chambers with flying colors, unanimously, I might add, um, and were signed into law by the governor on Monday. Next slide. Staying in the general topic of ratepayer protections, uh, we have House Bill 2305 from Delegate Webert. This bill stems from the patrons' concerns that utility projects could result in higher costs than a third party solar development, and that those costs would eventually be passed on to the ratepayers. As introduced, this legislation required that for the construction or acquisition of any renewable energy project by a utility to meet the goals of the Clean Economy Act, the project must be subject to competitive procurement. We, along with a number of other solar lobbyists and stakeholders, worked with the patron to ensure that he knew that there were already principles of competitive procurement enshrined in the Clean Economy Act. Accordingly, Delegate Weber agreed to rewrite the bill turning it into a section one bill that simply states that in any petition for a CPCN, the utility must demonstrate that the proposed facility was subject to principles of competitive procurement. As amended, there was really no opposition to the bill and ended up passing both chambers and was signed into law by the governor on Monday. So next I'll turn it over to Patrick to introduce shared solar legislation. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, and Chris and I had the opportunity to represent the shared solar industry on these bills through session, the Coalition for Community Solar Access. And um, they were uh, seeking to, one, uh, revise the Dominion program, the existing shared solar Dominion program. And the second is establish a program in the APCO territory. Um, so let me start with Senate Bill 1083, which sought to establish a 200 megawatt shared solar program in the APCO territory. Um, we started with a bill that really sought to address some of the issues we saw with the calculation of the minimum bill uh, for the Dominion territory and really sought to keep a fixed dollar amount cap on the minimum bill. That language was later changed through the process, which I think is important to understand in calculating the minimum bill and the way the SEC established it, essentially became in the Dominion Territory an addition of all of the different costs that a utility and ratepayers would incur or be left with in a shared solar program. And a lot of this is generation, transmission. And so we changed the model of this bill through the process to, instead of just calculating all of the costs that had to be calculated into a minimum bill, we also created a subtraction of all the benefits that would uh, be left with the ratepayers in the existing system and of course the utility. And so an example of some of those benefits that we, we put in the legislation would require the commission uh, to quantify benefits associated with the transmission system, benefits associated with the distribution system, um, purchased power benefits, fuel factor benefits, economic benefits, uh, and other environmental benefits. And so our goal was really to have the SCC take a look at all the benefits that shared solar provide, not just for the customers that subscribe, but for the entire electric generation, transmission and distribution system. Um, ultimately, we were able to get the bill out of the Senate on a, a pretty strong bipartisan vote, vote of 35 to 5, um, but the bill was defeated in the Republican-controlled House Commerce and Energy Committee. Um, with Dominion, we were seek with the Dominion bill, Senate Bill 1266, uh, looked very much identical in terms of the minimum bill language that I just described for the APCO bill. Um, the big difference with the Dominion bill was we were also seeking to expand the program size from 200 megawatts uh, to one gigawatt. Um, that bill passed the Senate 2415, so we did pick up a couple of Republican votes, uh, but then the bill died in the House Commerce, the Republican-controlled House Commerce and Energy Committee. 
I will briefly mention that uh, House Bill 1853, Delegate Subramaniam, uh, a Democrat in the House, um, felt very passionate about this, and he was uh, very helpful. He introduced a bill that really sought to do almost exactly what we were doing in the uh, APCO and Dominion bills, but he compressed all of that into one bill, and, and that died very early in the process in the House. That's a quick overview of the shared solar bills this session. And Chris, I'll kick it back to you. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I'll just note before moving on that, you know, in our advocacy in this space, we really saw this as the first in a multi-year effort um, to educate, inform, develop allies in both chambers and both parties, begin working with the governor's office, um, and obviously begin really advocating for the principles of shared solar as well as the legislation specifically. Uh, and we've really already begun our work for a year two effort. Um, we've been meeting with stakeholders. We've reached back out to the governor's office. Um, we've begun laying out plans for spring, summer, and fall, um, and we'll be ready to run legislation again in 2024. So next slide, please. So now our time is starting to run tight, uh, so I'll be pretty brief with these. Um, nuclear energy. Just wanted to briefly touch on nuclear, as I think when it comes to the energy landscape, both now and kind of in the, the near future, particularly under Governor Yunkin, uh, that nuclear is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, to that end, this year we saw more nuclear-related energy, uh, nuclear energy-related legislation introduced in really any year in recent memory. Um, nearly a decade ago, I served as an energy advisor to Governor McAuliffe, where we started having these conversations about nuclear deployment um, and SMRs. So it's been interesting to see, you know, nearly a decade later, this come back to the forefront. Um, of everyone's minds. Um, there were all sorts of bills this session pertaining to nuclear edu uh, energy. There was education grant bills, bills to include nuclear as renewable energy, budget items for SMR development and more. Um, but these were really the key bills uh, on this slide to leave you with today. Senate Bill 1464 and House Bill 2386 create the Virginia Power Innovation Fund and Program, uh, which is designed to fund the research and development of advanced energy technology, as well as establish a nuclear innovation hub in Virginia. These bills passed both chambers uh, with broad support and were signed into law by the governor. House Bill 2333 was the big SMR bill this session and sought to declare the policy of the Commonwealth to promote the development and adoption of SMR technology with the goal of having the first SMR in Virginia online by 2032. Uh, it also directed the SEC to establish an SMR pilot program. Um, the, the bill made it out of each chamber, but unfortunately the chambers just couldn't come to an agreement about the size or scope of the pilot program. Um, so despite kind of support and interest of both chambers, the bill did fail to pass. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, this come back next year. Next slide, please. Wrapping up, I'll quickly address uh, the budget as well as the political landscape, and then if we have 30 seconds, we'll get into questions. Um, as you may have heard, the General Assembly adjourned without agreeing to a revised budget. Now, Virginia operates on a biannual budget cycle, so technically there was no requirement or need to adopt a new budget as we still have an existing budget to work with. Um, nonetheless, since adjournment, budget negotiators have continued to communicate uh, with one another in attempts to work out a compromise that was unclear when, if at all, they'll come to an agreement. Uh, in fact, just the other day, it was reported that they're putting uh, a pause on things a bit as they await more information about a possible recession. Um, one thing worth noting here were that budget items introduced in, uh, by Delegate uh, Davis and Senator Marsden that directed the SEC to convene a work group and develop recommendations for streamlining and providing statewide uniformity in local siting processes for solar development. Neither of these amendments were included in either the House or Senate's final budget proposal, but they did start quite the conversation that is sure to continue throughout the year. Next slide. Finally, I just wanted to leave everyone with a glimpse of just how different the General Assembly is going to look uh, in the next several months. Uh, we're facing a truly historic level of turnover in the coming months. We have all 40 members of the Senate and all 100 members of the House up for election in brand new districts this fall. In the last several weeks, 22 legislators have already announced their retirements. Over a dozen delegates have announced campaigns for Senate 
And then we've got a handful of other legislators who are paired into the same district. So between these retirements, these competitive elections and delegates seeking other office, we're anticipating a turnover of at least 30 to 40% come November. And these are not just backbench or rookie legislators we're talking about. We're losing some major veterans and leaders in both chambers. Just to name a few, losing the Senate Majority Leader, Senate Minority Leader, the chairs of both Senate Commerce and Labor and House Commerce and Labor, the chair of Senate Local Government, the chair of Senate Finance, the chair of House Finance. So as you can see, this is gonna have a major impact on not just committee leadership, but committee composition across the board. And as challenging as this may be, however, it does present a real opportunity, especially for an industry like the renewable energy industry. Um, now is really the time to make new friends, develop allies, and educate and inform everyone we can. Uh, we have a real chance ahead of us to correct bad narratives and really foster a new appreciation for renewable energy. Um, our team's working overtime right now, working to identify new allies, develop uh, PAC plans, set up meetings and meet and greets with new candidates as well as new friends. So there are gonna be a lot of new faces and it will be a lot of work to educate this new look General Assembly, but that also means we have a lot of blank slates to work with, which is really an incredible opportunity going forward. So I'll pause there and turn it back to Brad. Thanks, Chris. I know we're running a little bit uh, over, so why don't we just uh, get to uh, just two questions and then we'll respond to others by email. Um, Patrick, I think the first question is, when is the governor up for re-election? Is he planning to run again? <laughs> yeah, good trick question, Brad. The, the, the governor in Virginia is only a one-term governor, um, but what's on everybody's radar, of course, is whether Governor Youngkin is going to throw his hat in the ring for the, the race for president. I think that's TBD. He's certainly uh, raising money and traveling the country with intentions of exploring that opportunity, but, but nobody knows. That's the million-dollar question. Um, but what we do know is that he will not be back uh, in another two years because he will have exhausted his term if he stays. Chris, uh, next one's for you. What is the governor's general take on shared solar? Is he generally in favor? Uh, it's a good question. And, you know, obviously I don't speak for the governor and can't speak to his support for any specific legislation in the future. But I do think it's fair to say that the governor's office and this administration does remain uh, generally supportive of shared solar as a concept. Uh, in fact, just last year, if you remember, the 2022 Virginia Energy Plan was introduced. And actually, it, it contains specific language in the recommendations section uh, that encouraged removing barriers to distributed generation, including shared solar. Um, so it's on the books for uh, his Virginia energy plan. We've been engaging with the governor's office uh, this year and we'll continue to engage with them next year uh, in hopes of finding some legislation that they can hopefully get on board with. Well, we're definitely over time now. So uh, we'll respond to the other uh, questions uh, by email, but uh, I appreciate everybody uh, attending this, this morning and special thanks to Chris and Patrick for the presentation. And if you have any other further questions, feel free to email us at energy at williamsmullen.com. Thanks again, and see you on April 13th for our next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everyone.